Okay, again, uh, I use the basis of somebody else's PowerPoint, so I cannot take credit for all the little fancy transitions and stuff, although they're kind of cool. So designers and technicians. Design. So its basic purpose is to transform something into looking like something else, okay? Um, something so that it may be seen by a willing viewer is something else. We have a bare stage, we're gonna make it look like a four, okay? We have, um, you know, we're doing a show outside, but we want some scenery to suggest we are in ancient Rome. So I'm gonna have some Roman columns or something like that. So the willing audience will say, oh, okay, I'm in a different place. But that's kind of what design is all about. The basic areas of theatrical design, there are several different areas, are scenery, costumes, lighting, and sound. Under costumes, we call the makeup and wigs and hair and all those kind of things. And under set, that also uh, falls props and furniture and things like that. So these are the big areas, um, scenery, costume, lighting, and sound. The design compromises most of what we see when we go to the theater. Remember we talked about how Aristotle had those six things that had to be needed to, and the number six one was spectacle? Okay, it's what we see. So when we think of designing for the theater, we think of what we see when we first walk in. So the design process. The initial framework for the design is the play itself. You can't design your set for a play that you haven't read, because you have no idea what's going to be needed. Okay, so, um, you know, Oedipus, I told you the story of Oedipus, right? It takes place in a whole bunch of different places. But if you read the script, you see exactly where everything happens. It's kind of like in front of the palace and stuff like that. So some of the stuff are stories that are told. So in reading the play, you get a sense of what you're going to need and what you're not going to need. Are you going to need a throne or are you not going to need a throne? Are you going to need two thrones because the queen comes out? Do they sit and talk? Do they stand and talk? So all these kind of things. Um, so you need to look at the play. The play is going to give you what you need to begin with. And I say to begin with, because then some people can take it way far the other way. Um, the first stage is a conceptual one, where ideas emerge from each designer's reading of the script and their research. So before I even talked to a director, a director said, hey, I'm going to direct um, Hamlet, and I'd like you to be the designer. So, okay, sure. Without even talking to them, the first thing I'm going to do is read it and kind of get some of my concepts down. The director might say, hey, I want to do Hamlet, and I want to set it in the, you know, 1800s. Okay. That's all I need to know to kind of get my ideas down. So I'm going to read the play through. When you are a designer the first time, you should read the play more than once. The first time you read it, you read it for comprehension, you know, for pleasure, for understanding, just reading the play and seeing what the story is, what's going to happen with the characters. Then the second time through, you start making notes. Oh, okay, this person enters here, so that means I'm going to have to have a door up there, okay? Or this person dances around the stage, so I need to make sure that their costume is loose enough that they can move. So all these kinds of things that you, you make notes of what's going on so that you can see. In Hamlet, there's a whole lot of sword fighting. There's a great big sword fight at the end and everybody dies. So they need to be able to be flexible and move around in their costumes. It can't be so cumbersome that they can't really lift up their sword. You, know? you can't have them fighting in a real armor. That's not, that's not good for the stage. It makes too loud noise. It's really heavy too. Anybody ever held chain mail? Okay, yeah, if you go to the Renaissance Festival, you can see a lot of it. My, my nephew and niece-in-law um, made their own chain mail for the Ren Fair. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you wear this on your shoulders? You carry it around? Heavy stuff, man. Okay, so the director usually leads the conversation, but the designers must eventually collaborate. The director says, I want to set it in the 1800s, and you know, I'm thinking of this kind of a vibe. And then the designer comes up okay, what about this, this, and this? Sometimes the director will meet with the designer and say, man, I don't like that. I'd rather have something else like this. So then the designer has to redesign, which is in the beginning why you kind of take notes and just do little sketches and ideas rather than your full-out renderings. 
Um, gradually, a comprehensive design emerges from the director's collaboration. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is scenery. What you see, scenery. It's usually what we first see, but it's actually a relatively new design area. Um, if you remember, and they had these sort of, I mean, the ones that have our old and they've kind of fallen apart, but even then they just had kind of a building backdrop. And then um, in ancient Rome, they had a little more elaborate backdrop, but it was all the same. So they had the same backdrop for every show that they did, whether it was a comedy or a tragedy, or, you know, whether it was about the kid killing her children or about um, birds taking over the world, you know. <laughs> there's, a, there's one that um, Aristophanes wrote called The Frog, and the chorus has a lot of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> same backdrop though. Even if you remember seeing the Globe Theater, remember I showed you that little video of Shakespeare's Globe Theater? There's no backdrops. That's just where they play. If they turned it into a palace, they might bring on a chair for the throne room, right? Or a couple of chairs, or a table, or a you know, a, this set piece or that set piece. The, uh, the soldiers, you know, carry, mostly carry kinds of props, things that you can pick up and move, but they don't change the set at all. The setting stays the same. So this is kind of a concept that happened really during the Renaissance period in Italy and then France and then Germany, and it kind of expounded through there. So early scene designers became as prominent as the playwright. So when they first started making these scenes, um, it was people went to the play to see the scenery as much as they did to see the play. The people who designed the scenery, they were like signing autographs like the playwrights were. You know, it was important to have, okay, we're going to go, our group is going to perform this play by this playwright, and we're going to get this set designer. Ooh, double whammy. Okay, you know, people are going to come from everywhere to see this show. Um, the proscenium format was created specifically to show off the elegant setting. So at this time in the world, they um, figured out how to do perspective drawing. So that's like um, if I'm drawing a tree, I'm drawing a forest, so I have closer to you, I have really big trees here, and then I have a little bit smaller tree, and a little bit smaller tree, and a little bit smaller tree, so that when I get to the end here, it looks like it's perspective. It doesn't look like it's flat on a piece of, you know, canvas or something like that. It looks like per perspective. Once they figured out perspective drawing, they started using it for everything, for scenery, for opera, for ballet. Um, and so they decided to build, because remember, there's the Globe Theater, there's the Shakespeare, and there's the Roman Theater. They decided to build these theaters that had the picture frame so that you could build the perspective scenery into it and you could do a big tree here a smaller tree here a smaller tree here a smaller tree here and it looked like it was much further and then the whole scenery would change and all the trees would go off and um there was a, a building that looked closer to you and a building that looked further a building that looked further a building that looked further any of her ever been to universal studios I think the Universal Studios or the MGM Studios, I can't remember which, but I think it's Universal. You can walk down the street and there's a great big thing where it looks like you're on Broadway or you know, like, yeah, and it looks like it's, you know, and it's just a, a backdrop, you know, or it's just a, a very sh short backdrop that looks like it's going wrong. So that's the, that's the kind of thing that they do with scenery. Um, proscenium is mostly what we use today. Again, it's that picture frame, that box, we're looking into things, right? We talked about the different kinds of, of stages, but this is the one that is the most prominent. We think we're gonna sit here and we're gonna watch that there. We used to watch movies that way, right? It is a picture frame when <laughs> we're watching movies or television. Okay, when we're talking about a thrust theater, do you remember what thrust is? Right. That's right, remember? <laughs> like, thrust theater. It's like someone thrust their tongue out at you. They took the whole proscenium stage and they thrust it down in the middle of the audience. So now there's audience in the front and on both sides. Okay, that's a thrust theater. Okay, this is going to be on the desk, guys. 
So it just thrust goes out into the middle of the audience. There is the, the there's the proscenium, which is the most popular. There's the thrust, and then there's the arena. Game or basketball game, you were in an arena. Okay, the arena is on all sides. Sometimes it's also called theater in the round. So, an arena theater. That's pretty easy to remember if you've ever been to an arena. Anyone here never been to an arena? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes they have them like in the round. Sometimes they'll set up a concert where you have a big thing that's in the round, but they'll set up like one side of the stage and make it so that everybody's looking that way. But yeah, sometimes they'll set the band in the middle and everybody's sitting all the way around. So um, it depends on how, because they can configure them different ways. Um, whenever you go to the rodeo, they kind of do it in the round. You know, well, there's people on all sides, but then they have the concert after the rodeo. They have that in the middle too. So I have, to refresh your memory, this is what a proscenium stage looks like. Uh, this is what a thrust stage looks like. So they've taken the proscenium, thrust it out to the middle of the audience. So there's audience on three sides. And then this is what an arena theater looks like. Um, the theaters that are built to be arena theaters. So you have the action taking place in the middle and you have audience sitting all the way around. It's really difficult to stage this kind of thing. Somebody's back is always to the audience. Right now, I teach my students in acting class, never turn your back on the audience. <laughs> when your back is always to some member of the audience, they set up the furniture so it's all the way kind of around the perimeter. So if this person comes over here and sits down, they're not blocking the audience's view of the people that are sitting down. So depends on how My husband did um, Into the Woods. Into the woods. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. I think I mentioned it. So my husband designed. Well, no, he worked on a show. He did not design it. Into the woods is um, it's a fairy tales kind of all squished together. There's uh, Rapunzel and Snow White and Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella. Yeah. Okay. And they all kind of come together. They all take place in the woods. You know, in and around the woods. And um, the first act is everybody's happily ever after. And then the second act, the giant comes down, starts wreaking havoc, kills people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, everything bad happens. But the whole thing is that it's supposed to take place in a forest. So, how do you make a forest in the round and still manage to see all the actors? Because you still have to have the illusion of trees. What they did was they had things called scrims, round scrims like on pool hoops. And it's, so they would, if they were down, they were all the way flat down on the stage. And when they would raise up, they would look like trees, but you could see through it. So it's like see-through material, these scrims. And so they did um, Into the Woods in a stage like that, which is just, I mean, that had to won awards, you know, that's just a brilliant design to be able to do that. I don't think that I could have ever thought of anything like that. The last kind of stage you might remember is the black box. So this is, you can take, you can see how these um, break apart. You can move this seating and you could, right now it looks like the proscenium stage, but you can move it and you can make it you know, for us, so you can move it, you can make it in the round, you can kind of do a whole lot of things. With it. This is why it's also called a flexible theater space or a black box. And it's usually painted black. Why it's a black box. Okay. At the cellar theater over there, that's theirs is a black box at the public theater. Their cellar theater is a black box. Okay, brief history of scene design. The first scenery was painted and flat. Okay, so we just had a um, picture of here's woods. Okay, <laughs> we're taking place in the woods. Um, they had things called drops that um, they still have them in some theaters today. They take a piece of canvas and they paint a scene on it, like like this. They paint a scene on it, and then they they take it and they roll it up. The whole thing is 
hold up. And when it's time for the next scene, they drop it. And the next scene comes down in front of the last scene. Oh, they were in the woods. Now they're in town. You know, now they're in the marketplace. And so the next drops come down. Some um, theaters had it. That was the easiest way to do it if you were not going to have to take, take it up and down and you didn't have a whole lot of space. You didn't have a towering space. If you look, most theaters are built so that as much space as you see on stage, there has to be at least that space, that same amount of space above the stage for things to fly in and out. So for scenery to come in and out. So they might have a drop or something, but it would be all the way open and they would have ropes that pull it up and away so that you can't see it. And then ropes that drop down. They have projection you know, screens, they have different fabrics. They have all sorts of things that can be cloned in and out. The last show that they did, it was called Anatomy of Grey. Any of you ever seen that? In Anatomy of Grey, <clears throat> this man named Dr. Grey lands um, in this little podunk town that they didn't even have a doctor you know, back in the 1800s or whatever in colonial America. Um, and they, uh, he, he lands there because he's in a balloon. So he's in a balloon, his balloon crashes. Well, in order to show this, they show the people at the scene and they're like, what's that, what's that? And something comes down out of the sky and hits the floor and they're like, it's a shoe. <laughs> so they had to rig, and somebody had to, you know, figure out a box that would open with a pulley that would let that shoe fall out just at the right exact time onto the stage. Another show I was in, a guy had to catch an orange that fell from the ceiling. And so he had to be in exactly the right spot. They had this other little box set up and whenever they say this one line, an orange would drop from the sky and everyone would go, oh, oh, okay. So, <laughs> did a lot of children's theater. Okay, but first scenery was just painted flat. Um, there was something called the wing and drop scenery, which was very popular. So they had these grooves built into the floor. And remember I told you about the perspective? So they would have, they would literally have a painted big tree, a painted smaller tree, a painted smaller tree, a painted smaller tree. And then when it was time for that to go out, someone would pull all of those out and put in the next scene. Um, they mechanized this and I actually have um, a little video I want to show you. It's like a two minute video so don't blink because it's a really good video and um, it's pretty impressive. Oh, one minute and 54 seconds. Let me make this big. Okay. You ready? Don't play. Watch the scenery. This theater impact with all of the stuff working. Please sit down and watch this so quickly. Two minutes. changing the set. It's all from like the 1600s. Well, the thunder box there's rocks in it when it goes back and forth it sounds like thunder it's a german opera you see what people look like on that's how it ended
it down. Ta -da. So they found this in a German palace, um, Drotzing home. <laughs> okay. And um, it had been locked up and boarded up for centuries. And they found this like in the 1970s or something like that. And so they kind of, um, you know, repainted it or whatever, revamped it a little bit just with the original stuff and everything is still working. And so now you can go there and you can see shows. Too. But the show is just watching the scenery change. So that's why people would go to the shows just to see the scenic design. Like it was really cool. Yes, that's the um, the pole and chariot. The pole and chariot. Mm -hmm. um, so they would, yeah. So they would like you know turn around and they had a, a pole that would pull things off and yeah. So it's pretty uh pretty incredible. Okay. Uh, So that's yeah, the wing and drop set, and it's also called pole, the pole and chariot. Actually, was the one that came right after wing and drop. Okay. Um, then advances in technology, the box set has become realistic in detail. So a box set, yeah. I just didn't want you to miss that because that's the cool video. All right, so a box set basically it looks like you're looking in a box. We look at the set and we see back wall, we see their side wall, we see this side wall, and we are the fourth wall, right? So breaking the fourth wall means talking to the audience by breaking the fourth wall. So this is called the box set, even though it's a little sort of laid out. Um, but we've also, it came with the advent of realism. Like people wanted realistic sets. They wanted things to look absolutely like they do now. You're going to watch, um, we all need to go watch rumors because that's part of your assignment. When we do it here, and it's going to be in the McCreelis Theater, which is why I'm pointing over there. And um, it's it's realistic set. It takes place. It was written to take place in the 1990s, so I don't know if she's set there or if she's changed the time period. But it's supposed to look real. It's a farce, which means it's a comedy and it's fast paced. And lots of silly things go on. Then they also have, I said this wrong, metaphoric game design. Tell us what a metaphor is. Oh, well, right. You're saying something is like something else or something to add something else. It's like or add. And um, it's without like or add. But yeah, assembly is using like or add. The metaphor is saying, I am a butterfly. Somebody's saying, I'm like a So, um, right. So, metaphor is turning something into something else. I call it metamorphic. It's morphing into something else. Metaphoric. So, this um, set with all the kites and the way that the lighting is hitting this everything is supposed to be a metaphor for whatever's happening in the play. So I went, I think I mentioned this to you guys, I went to a play called Tommy over at the Public Theater. And um, if the Who is the band who sings this album, sings Tommy, and one of the songs is, was made famous by Elton John and other people, it was called Pinball Wizard. So he's a pinball wizard at the theater. So anyhow, the whole <laughs> album is actually about this boy. He witnesses um, a murder. I think it's the murder of one of his parents. I can't remember. But huh? That man. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like that man. No, but he goes, we would call it autistic now. They didn't say. They said um, he was deaf, dumb, and blind. So dumb means you can't speak. So in the song, it says that deaf, dumb, and blind kid sure plays me pinball. So the story is about everything that happens to him afterwards. And they're not good things, guys. Like he gets molested by his uncle. Like, you know, it's like all these 
terrible things happen to this kid, but because he's um, deaf, dumb, and blind, you can't tell anybody, right? So, um, and as he gets older, but he can play pinball. He can play pinball. They're like, how How does he play? He plays pinball. Anybody here ever play pinball? Like a pinball machine? Okay. Okay. You know, it's not, it's, you lose, right? <laughs> he never did. And he was like, you know, have the score would go higher and higher and higher and higher. And he was, he was just a pinball wizard. Well, when I walked into the theater, the entire set looked like a pinball machine. So that is the metaphor, right? So the whole set. And then when they started using it, they didn't use it any differently. They used it like the kitchen table. They used it like whatever they were. But, um, but the whole thing was a metaphor for the pinball. So that's what we mean by a metaphoric set. It represents what's going on in the play. Um, tends to be more conceptual than literal, right? So it's a concept. Um, this type of design made its appearance in the 1980s and 1990s. So before this, we kind of went with the realism. And then, you know, anytime we establish something, somebody's got to try to break the mold. And then when somebody breaks the mold, we all want to break the mold with them. So that's when this started happening. So sometimes you'll go see a show where your set is very metaphoric, and sometimes you'll go and see them it's very literal. Uh, Post-modern design is identifiable by its conscious disruption of unifying themes. So post-modern. The modern era is like the early 1900s, and postmodern is what we're in now. We're, we're after modern. We're not modern. We're after modern. I don't know what you call that other than postmodern. Okay, we we disrupt things. You know, whatever whatever is um, set as status quo, there'll be a lot of breakage of that. Um, the best scenic design today is so much more than mere backing for the action of the play. I mean, so same in the uh, Renaissance era, because I would go to the theater just to see those things happen and who cares what the acting and singing was like. You know, they have a lot of stuff like that. They did big spectacular things between the scenes. They were called intermezzi, and they had like carnival acts almost. They had, you know, people walking on tight ropes and acrobats and all sorts of things. But um, today the set is, it's not just the backdrop. It, it means something. So remember I told you about the play that goes wrong, like everything falls apart in the set? Well, they did a, a kind of a mock interview with the cast about the set. And they were talking about the set. They're like, oh yeah, the set's the star. He's a diva. He wants his own dressing room. Yeah. <laughs> because the set is just so spectacular. All the things that it did and happened on the set were just so brilliant that um, they take on a life of their own. So it's more intrinsic to the play's action. The set's going to be not just a backdrop, but it's also going to be functional. So um, they did a play last year here called Next to Normal. And I thought it was a really neat design because they had um, a kitchen table down here. And then over here were stairs going up. And then there was a platform that was the bedroom. So um, there were people in the bedroom and people in the kitchen, and you understood that they couldn't hear each other. So that it was, but it was intrinsic to the action of the play, and it was functional at the same time. Um, it's where the play exists. I mean, the director or the designer could have decided, oh, they just had two different places on the stage, right? This is the bedroom, this is the kitchen. And, We'll pretend there's a wall in between, but they didn't. They, you know, kind of extended it and used their imagination. Um, it also determines how the play exists. So, um, you know, if you're watching Alice in Wonderland, it has to look like, I, I say that one a lot. <laughs> you know, I like to think of that, that kind of um, concept. You know, it's where the play happens how the play happens. Okay, what are, what is it made out of? Platform, okay, it's the most fundamental thing. A platform is four feet by eight feet. Okay, so it's four feet wide and eight feet long. So this is 
everything starts there. You need a platform. You have to step up and somewhere for somebody to stand on is a platform. If people listen to the theater right now, they have a bunch of platforms out there because they're starting to build the set and platforms on top of platforms. So the platform is really important. And again, it's a specific measurement. And um, every theater, at least in Western civilization, uses these same measurements when they're building. They might make them different, um, but if you're going to have one that is a different size, you're gonna have a four by eight in there and then extra things on the outside. Because they keep these so that they can use them over and over again. It's also the same size as a flat, okay? A flat is a frame and it's either covered with material like canvas or muslin or um, a Hollywood flat is actually covered with a thin piece of wood called masonite. They call it Hollywood flats. I guess they originated in Hollywood, but this is going to be on your head. Guys. That's why I'm looking at the floor. Platforms and flats, they are the things that keep building and building. Because we'll get everything in, in the theater. Flats and platforms. And flats, um, you know, if you take stagecraft, I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching stagecraft next semester for anybody who's interested in taking that. Um, that's going to be fun and interesting, but we're going to build flats. So we're going to, you know, build some of the scenery. And that's where you paint the backdrops on. So we were just looking at, you know, a picture of the wall. Well, the flat might have a painted bookcase with books on it, or the flat might just be faint, painted the color of the wall and you might actually have a real bookcase with books on it. So it just depends on the play and on the style and everything. The flats are where you paint the back of everything. Dr. Cohen. Drapery, drapery is usually used to neutralize space that we aren't supposed to look at. So again, if you go in there from a pre theater and you walk onto the stage, there's drapery, not just in the front of the stage, but in the back. There's a lot of black drapes. They're called the travelers, um, because they can travel in and travel out. We did a show in there over the summer with my acting class, and there was a great big ladder there, and I didn't know how to get rid of it. I mean, it was huge. And so I just took the black drape and pulled it around the ladder. It's the high things you're not supposed to see. Could be actors, could be a big ladder. You just never know. But that's how we use drapery on the stage too. Set pieces often become focal points and light can be used as scenery as well. Do you remember when we were looking at that, um, that set designer and the girl walks out there and she did this with her hands and the light reflected off of it? Like she was putting her hands in those points of light. So we can use light sometimes as scenery. They, they make these things um, called gobos. Is I have a light here and I have this, it's a little filter that you can put on it, and it might it'll have holes cut out in it in certain patterns. So if I want to pretend that my actors are in a forest, I might have leaves cut out in the pattern and have the light shining on them so that it looks like they're in a forest. Or if I want to make sure they look like they're in an office building, I might have one that looks like it's blinds and looks like it's the light coming in from the blinds and stuff like that. So gobos are fun. And so light can be used as part of scenery as well. Projections can provide interesting visuals. So So I told you about the Anastasia that I saw on Broadway, and they had that projection of the train that was going forward, and then when the train turned, the train was going sideways with the projections and stuff. So that is also utilized as scenery. And stage machinery can create interesting stage shifts. So when I worked, um, helped out at an Estonian um, high school, they did Aladdin. And on the back of the stage was a machine. And I'm telling you, the machine was probably as big as this thing and that thing together. It was just this ginormous thing. And it had a lever on it with a platform that was about, uh, I would say, six by six. And that was the back of the set. 
So they covered everything else in drapery so you couldn't see it. And they did fog. And they got onto the magic carpet and they had to set the down, which made me really sick, you know, um, for a whole new world. It was pretty spectacular. <laughs> and I will tell you, everything that they do at that school is pretty spectacular because of the director there. If she ever leaves, the whole thing's going down with you. But she, she's just, she, the, the things that she thinks of, I would never think to do. I mean, I did Aladdin, my, my little tiny theater. Yeah, and um, our magic carpet was two little girls, <laughs> you know, and they, they wore the little hats that looked like the little, like they were, and they ran around and they, they like opened up the carpet on them and then they take it off and, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, they had that machinery in the fog and yeah. So stage machinery, you can do some pretty, and then look at the stage machinery from back in the day that we were looking at at that drawing home, whatever I can't say right here in front of that. Um, there was one guy standing on it and it was being raised, right? So he was coming up through the floor and stuff. So stage machinery can do some incredible set things. Hamlet, the, the ghost of his father comes back and talks to them. And I've seen like several productions where the ghost comes up out of the floor, you know, so things like that. When I did my Julius Caesar, I had to come back as a ghost after I died. And so I had to crawl pretty much like crawling under this table, under the stage. And there was an area about this big and I had to like hop through and then slowly rise as if I was being, you know, up with hydraulics or something like that. And like kind of stand up <laughs> like I was being raised. So um, there's some fun things that can be done. Furniture and properties fall under the jurisdiction of the playwright. So if it's written in the script by the playwright, you kind of have to have it on the set. Like if the, the playwright thinks, well, you know, he sits on the sofa and puts his feet up on the coffee table, and that's written in there by the playwright, somehow the designer is going to have to put in a sofa and a coffee table. Okay. Or, you know, unless the director decides to scrap it and do something different, um, but mostly the furniture and like props, you know, carried in a knife, all right, he's going to carry in the knife. That's kind of determined by what happens, what's written in the play. Lighting. Okay, lighting did not begin with the discovery of electricity. Um, so back in uh, you know the caveman days, if they were doing a show, somebody had. So we always had some sort of lighting. And in Shakespeare's time, remember they used the sunshine, okay? Um, but then they also tried to enhance the sunshine. They would get a big piece of a glass or mirror kind of metal to shine the light where they wanted it. And so they, they were doing that even during, you know, 1840s time. But whenever they end up having metal, so glass. Um, also, during Shakespeare's time, there were some theaters that did it completely by candlelight. But when they did it by candlelight, especially in France, when they started doing um, the perspective scenery, they only had candles. And you've heard of the footlights? Well, they, they were really functional. So there were lights all around the bottom of the stage so that when the actors stood in front of the stage, they couldn't see them. They had like um, little mirrors. They, um, you heard of the limelight? Okay, that's actually a piece of limestone in the light, <laughs> you know, and spark to shine on people. So, um, back in, like I said, in France, they had big chandeliers that could be lowered so they could light them and they'd raise them up, but the audience was also illuminated. So the audience was in light as well as the people on stage. It being dark in the audience and light on stage, that's just actually kind of a um, what much more recent thing. Okay, so the Greeks oriented their theaters, theaters to make the best use of light. So they built them so that 
It took place during the day. The sun's coming up over here. There's not a shadow cast over the, you know, playing space. Um, medieval theater made use of devices to reflect the sunlight, like I said. And um, the Renaissance artists used candles. And the 19th century invention of gaslight but paved the way for the way that we once we had gas, like natural gas, like you use, some, some people still use it for their stove. Mine isn't plumbed for gas, but some people still use it to light your stove, right? Um, or your hot water heater, or, you know, things like that. You have gas that you turn on for fireplaces now and stuff like that. Um, they were able to put it in special places. So they were able to make it so that they had a light here, a light here, a light here, a light here. And they could find them and focus them the way they wanted. And so once they had that gas going through, the first they had um, like all of the lines of gas there that one can't ever reach. And they turned them on and turned these off to make the lights there. So it was actually pretty sophisticated when they started using gas. Um, you know, there were still a lot of theaters that burned down. So, you know, <laughs> not, not always the best option. Um, electricity provides enormously flexible light, right? Now that we have electricity and now LED lights, we can do even more with them than we could with just before. Um, so this is the set of Zarathustra said some things, no? Um, you can see the different colors of lighting that are on here. It's not just lights up, lights down. Okay? It's not just illuminating the set. Now they use the different colors for different meaning, for different textures, as it were, okay, to add to what's going on in the set. Today, most lighting is conceived and produced by a lighting designer. And the lighting designer, as a separate artist, really only developed in the mid 20, 20th century. Visibility and focus are the primary considerations. Okay, so this might be beautiful, but, and you can see how it's sort of reflected here and sort of reflected there and little things like that. That's probably a go-go, like I was telling you, some sort of filter they put on it so that the light shines through and makes different patterns here and here. Um, but if the actor stands over there and you can't really see him well because he's all in blue, then it doesn't work. So, Still, the actors must be visible. The action on stage must be visible. It can be pretty and it can be wonderful, but you still have to think about that's the primary concern. How many of you have uh, been to a, a nightclub or a concert or seen these Intella lights? Okay, they spin around, they got all different colors, they, you know, all different patterns in them. And you can program them. <laughs> we use some of those in the theater now too. Um, and it's really cool because we can tell it, I want you to be white now. Now I want it to be yellow. Now I want it to be blue. Whereas, come on, man. You have to climb up on the ladder and put a blue gel in this one and a yellow gel in this one. Okay, it wasn't even all that bad in my day. I mean, that's also like if your theater can afford it. <laughs> so, um, so what happens if you were to become a lighting designer? What would you do? Okay, so they are gonna do their research. They're going to read the show. Like they need to know if there's any special effects that happen, like and with ghost father coming up, that's gonna be lit differently than is the dining room scene. Okay, or you know, if we're gonna have Hamlet in the grave sitting by himself, you know, how is that gonna be lit differently than the duel? So you have to be able to read the play and know what's going on in the play so that you know what you're gonna to have to light. Then they write, they compose this thing called a light plot. This is um, a drawing. A lot of times they do it uh, on CAD now. CAD stands for something auto design. <laughs> I cannot remember what CAD stands for, but basically you can draw it on a computer, which is a really nice thing. Because again, when I was a girl, um, we had to draw out every single one of these instruments and how we would have them pointed and where we would have them pointed. 
I want you to notice that um, you can't just do a few like somebody sent me somebody in one of the, the flex class so they did this uh, a week or so ago they were talking about lighting and they said that they were going to have three lights and a projector I'm like you can't do anything with three lights <laughs> anywhere I had a stage that was two platforms long it was 16 feet by eight feet and um, yeah you can't do anything with three lights I had six lights I went and I got them from Home Depot. They were those little silver work lights. And like we had a ceiling like this, so I flipped them up there. And I had the little dimmer switches and you know, like you would use the wood wall, make them go on and off. But I want you to notice how many lights there are here and here and here. And there are lights on the sides. Okay. Um, and then uh, this is a pole lights on it this is a pole with lights on it so um they're showing you how they should all be hung and where they should be pointed more or less so you figure out where they should be hung and how they should be pointed so you have some pointed this way and some pointed this way that are going to actually shine in the same spot but if you put different colors in them it makes it come out almost white but um, a more pleasing white. So there's like a, a, a blue and an amber that you put together and it makes people look better than if you just shine white light on them. White light's gonna you know, be too stark. Right here, this is a legend. This shows you which kind of lighting instrument because some of them are short in spots, some of them are long to reach longer. Um, this and this, you can see, these two ones, they're over the set. They're actually on poles. If you go and stand on the stage and look up, you'll see them. They're the lights that are hanging down, okay? Um, and so those poles can fly up and down and in and out. Um, this one is in front of the stage. So if you guys are on the stage, you'll be, you know, out, or yeah, you guys are on the stage, you'll be out here in the audience shining as well. And then they also have, um, you know, every once in a while, there are people up in the balcony with spotlights. Now, if we have the Intella lights, we can have them be the spotlights for us. But an actor also needs to work with the spotlights and the cues. There was a, um, the last show that they did, there was a person who walked across stage. They walked across over here. They stopped and they pulled something on, and then they walked over here. And they turned to go well they were late okay so they walked here they kind of messed up on their line and they thought about it and then the last thing was come in and while they're still talking they can bring it up so sometimes technology is wonderful when it all works together when people don't mess it up okay so this is called a light plot the lights are mounted to the proper lighting positions that's called hanging the lights so they're hung and then they're pointed where they're supposed to be pointed that's the This is the light. This is what a light plot is. Okay, so this is this picture here is what a light plot is, where they draw out every little light and show where they're it's going to be pointed. After they have a light plot, then technicians look at the light plot, climb up and say, okay, we need to put that one here. Okay, it needs to be facing that there. Okay, I'm gonna hang it. First of all, I'm gonna put it there, I'm gonna screw it in, and then I'm going to focus it. I'm going to adjust it. Usually when they focus it, they have somebody standing on the stage. Stand in, okay, stand right there. Okay, is that about how tall the actor is? Because you might be looking to try to get light shining, you know, narrowly on somebody's face. And um, the guy that you have standing there is six foot tall, but then the person that they have come is like five foot. And so the light's then shining over there. <laughs> so you got to make sure that you have the right height when you're focusing your lights. The final phase is supervising the technical rehearsals. The, um, you know, the, the lighting designer, they draw out the plot and hang, supervise hanging the lights and focusing the lights, making sure they're in the right places, making sure they're programmed to come on and off at the same time, because now we do it all through um, computers, where it used to be that, okay, it's time, we're going to take those down and we're going to put these up, but now you can do that all on a computer and just have somebody press the button next to you. Next problem is if they get lost, it's hard to go back. 
Um, but the final phase, the lighting designer comes in and watches and says, okay, yeah. And then the director says, you know what? It's too dark over there. Can we get some more light? So sometimes I'll hang a couple extra lights so we can change things. Sometimes they have to go in and hang extra lights after the director sees it and says, no, we don't like it. Okay, so that's lighting. Okay, costumes. So the first theatrical costumes were ceremonial vestments. We still use ceremonial vestments, um, like uh, different religions. Um, you know, even when people get married, those are ceremonial, you know, vestments, things that they have on that indicate this is different than what's normally going on. So the first costumes were that kind of thing, where the, the shaman wore something different or the priest wore something different, you know, so that we would know there was something special going on. In the Renaissance, there was still no attempt made to suit the costume of the characters. So during the Renaissance, they had their own clothes and they pretty much just wore their own clothes for the show. So they could be wearing something different every night. Most of the time they kind of did the same thing, but you know, you gotta wash that, so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they didn't have dryers back then, so. Day and your clothes aren't dry, you probably won't wear too many. Um, if you think about this, in England, only men played the women's part, right? They didn't allow any women on stage. So these guys had to have a wardrobe of female clothes as well as their own clothes. So, but they were just regular clothes of the day. There was not really a um, you know, any effort to make them look like they were somewhere else or that they were doing or that they had a, a specific character. The Commedia dell'arte, though, they had specific costumes for specific characters. Remember the ones I told you about with the mask? And they would, they still have those, um, those stock characters. So there are the lovers, there is the, the old lech, there is the comedian with the slapstick right, that falls all the time. Um, and those characters, they're very specific and they have specific costumes and they have specific masks they wear, they wear like half masks. And you can still go to Italy and you can still purchase these masks. And I mean, the comics are still out of place too. But um, my son got one, and one of his friends went to Italy and brought him one. Um, and so they still use these. So they were the ones that had, this one wears this all the time. If the Harlequin is always wearing the diamond, okay? So, uh, modern costuming developed from the 18th and 19th century and the requirements for realistic garments for the character. So remember that um, in the early 1900s, they decided that realism was the way that it was. We wanted things to look exactly the way that they're supposed to look. So that's why if we're setting something in ancient Greece, well, they're going to be wearing what those people wore in ancient Greece. So this is when if we wanted it to look real and we wanted to believe that we were transported to wherever that was, that's when costuming started to come into vogue. There are four basic functions of a costume. Okay, it provides a hint of ceremonial magic, right? Everybody likes to play dress up. I mean, all kids like to play dress up. So I had a box of dress up clothes at acting up and it didn't matter. Boys, girls, everybody wants to put on the dress up clothes, wants to be the pirate, wants to be the cowboy, wants to, I had my old prom dresses in there. And like every child, every child, male, female, all put on those prom dresses, <laughs> okay? You know, everybody loves to play dress up. Because it, it makes you feel like you're somebody different. It gives, it gives us as the audience too, it's like, oh, that's somebody different, okay? And it makes the actor, once an actor, a lot of times actors will say, well, once I get into costume and makeup, then I really feel like I'm that person. So it gives you a little ceremonial magic. It also, um, costumes of a play show is what kind of world we're asked to enter. So, you know, if you're going to go to the musical and you see the cat, the hat, and you see somebody dressed like Horton, the elephant, um, then you know what world you're supposed to be in. So as well as the set, the costumes show us that too. The two, an individual costume expresses the individuality of each character. 
So each character is different, even though, okay, I understand that this play is taking place during this time period, but people still have their individuality. And each character is going to show me a little bit of their personality. So if I'm playing a nun, I'm going to dress differently than if I play Foxy. Okay, it's going to show you the differences. Okay, we're going to see kind of what more their characters are. It's going to be a little more um, rather than what they you might normally wear on a regular day. It's going to be more, a little more symbolic. And um, it also serves as a functional wearable piece of clothing for the actor. Right? They got to wear this. So when you're designing costumes, you have to think about that too. Oh, I'm going to have them make um, this entire thing out of fishnet from head to toe. Their hands, everything is going to be fishnet. I don't know if any of you have ever worn fishnets before, but they leave little marks all over your body and like, your, you know, you ever fishnet um, gloves, you know, your hands all, they, they start poking through and it's really uncomfortable. So um, when you're designing things like that, oh, that might look good, but maybe you might not want to do that because you have to think this person has to wear it and they have to wear it for the whole show or whatever it is. You know, um, so you have to take in those considerations because it actually has to be functional, wearable, and sometimes it can be quick change. Okay, um, so telling you guys about when we did um, uh, Beauty and the Beast and the girl runs off stage and holds up her hands like that, we take down her dress, she sits in the other dress and pulls it back on. So you gotta be able to do that kind of thing too. Okay, the costume design process. And get this in. Um, after collaboration with the director and other designers, the costume design produces costume designer produces a set of colored drawings called renderings. I've shown you pictures of those. Okay, so after we've decided, okay, this is what they want, I'm going to draw the rendering. Now, one of my favorites is the one that I showed you that was the pirate lady. Okay, and it can have things like the rendering on that one had we want her skirt made out of. Um, you know, it looks like torn sails, but it could also be made out of net, you know, because it was all about being really cute. And they gave options for these different kinds of hats and maybe these different kinds of shoes so that, you know, your rendering doesn't have to be complete. And this is exactly it. It can have some options on there too. But the renderings, the designer then oversees the acquirement of all materials. When a costume is made, we don't call it selling a costume. We call it building a costume. Just like you would build a set, okay? You would build a prop, you build a costume. Because a lot of times it is um, not all showing. <laughs> Let's just say sometimes you hot glue things to each other, okay? Sometimes there's a lot of Velcro involved, but there's quick changes going on, you know? And, um, you know, somebody's and the rips and they have to go back on stage and there's the old stage rip. Okay, so anyhow, you call it building a costume when they're creating a costume. Ah, uh, sometimes costumes are made, sometimes they're bought, sometimes they're rented, sometimes they're borrowed. I did a show at my church and it was supposed to be a travel back through time, kind of a you know Scrooge thing, but it was Mary and Joseph. I don't know, <laughs> taking people back through Christmas of the ages. And uh, it went back during the Renaissance period, and there was a whole Renaissance, you know, scene. I didn't have any Renaissance costumes, so because I went to Texas State, I got to borrow the costumes. So I went there and I picked some out, borrowed some Renaissance costumes, brought them in, and my actors had to wear them. So sometimes you borrow them. When they did um, the Lion King over at Antonia, the director drove to Florida and borrowed the costumes from somebody, drove them back on a U-Haul, then you know, back again. Yeah. Either she borrowed or she rented. She probably rented it. But um, so there's there's ways to get customs. We have a costume closet here at SAC, and most theaters have a costume closet. Because once you do a show, what are you going to do with the costumes? Well, they keep them, and sometimes you can repurpose them for different shows. Sometimes, oh, that dress is going to work, but we have to change the collar and we have to do this and we have to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gibson's uh, Gibson's is a great place, and Gibson's is uh, Gibson's and Starline. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
And we're gonna stop here. A good costume design creates a sense of character, period, style, and theatricality. Okay. And we're gonna pick up on sound next time. Yeah, give some Starlin is really the thing. edit this. So um, remember I told you we're working on a new edition of the book. So after I was uh, done with the class yesterday, I also went and looked at the PowerPoints to, to make sure that there, the new PowerPoints that the, the book just put out to make sure there wasn't anything I missed that was important. And there were a couple of things. So I'm going to go back through this just a little bit and talk about the things that I hadn't really covered so that you can um, but you can see them. And I put this little blank here so I'd remember where we were. We had just talked about metaphoric scene design, not metamorphic, metaphoric scene design. And um, first of all, I wanted to show you this picture because I thought it was pretty. Um, <laughs> this is, um, they, they talk about being abstract. Abstraction is used for um, artistic and entertainment purposes, as well as due to necessity. So this is actually a traveling show made on this elephant. You can see there's people up here on the elephant, and they park this somewhere and perform it. It's kind of being pushed by that. But see the feet as they roll, the elephant walks. So it's a metaphor for what's going on in the play. I don't know. <laughs> but I'd really like to see it, you know, and this, you know, spectacular. And so they use the, you know, the metaphor, but also to entertain. And it's also got to be functional. An actor has to be able to get on there. I mean, they can make this wonderful elephant, but if you actors can't climb on it and use it in some way, then um, it's just a cool piece and not part of a theater thing. Um, spectacle, we talked about spectacle is abstraction that amazes a spectator, right? When we're talking about, you know, when someone says, oh my gosh, it was such a spectacle. Sometimes we're talking about, oh, somebody made a scene out there. Oh, they made a spectacle of themselves, right? But for the most part, when things are spectacular, I think of uh, P.T. Barnum, okay? He wanted his, did, did you all see The Greatest Showman? It is a beautiful movie. It's a wonderful um, musical. And I didn't want to see it. Because I was in a show that was actually called Barnum, that was a musical. And it was, eh. and I was like, yeah, I know the story. And then I saw it and I was blown away. First of all, I'm a huge Hugh Jackman fan. So, boring. Okay, <laughs> let's see um, the, oh my gosh. That is the museum. Is it the third one? Is it three? Yeah, three. When they go, when he goes to Europe, <laughs> they go to Europe and they end up running across the street, and Hugh Jackman is starring in a show. And, you know, the little guy said, What's a Hugh Jackman? You know, he's like, Wait, 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 wait I'll show you. Um, you'll recognize me a lot. Watch. <laughs> It is really funny. You should watch it. Okay. But yeah, and, and I was going, what is he doing? <laughs> He's just trying to look like Wolverines. Um, so, metaphorical things, we need to be able to understand what the metaphor is. Like I told you how when I went to go see Tommy by the Who, I understood that pinball machine was a metaphor for what was going on, not just because it was the pinball wizard, but because this pit was being bounced back and forth you know, all over the place. So it was a, a good metaphor for what was happening in the story. So um, you have to be able to understand them. Otherwise, it means nothing to your audience. So there's that. Okay, there's something that's called metatheatricality. I keep saying metamorphosis instead. Metatheatricality is a technique that balances between realism and abstraction. So sometimes 
Um, they will have, you know, realistic things going on and then some crazy abstract thing happen in the middle of the shows. So I mentioned a few times I went and saw Anastasia on Broadway and in Anastasia, there are people running around. We see, um, you know, people fighting and we see the, the wars going on and um, later all of a sudden she's remembering what it was like to be at the palace and we see these holograms dancing on the stage, you know, and it's her memory. So it's an abstract kind of a thing. And we realize this is what she's remembering. How do they do it? I don't know that method. <laughs> There's, there are different kinds of projectors. So you saw the, the actual, oh, you okay. yeah. Oh, see, well, my, so my kids saw the movie, like the cartoon, yeah. Um, well, when they did that, it was pretty cool. I mean, she's there on stage and she's remembering what it was. And she was actually able to like walk around the hologram. It was really cool. On the stage with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, um, they. It is. It's, it's kind of the reflections and things. But like I said, this and the stage of the. Play. It was good. It wasn't phenomenal, but the technical things were phenomenal. <laughs> I saw it on Broadway, and that that was the kind of thing where you go, "Wow!" So that's called meta theatricality. So we're using real people, and we're using some abstract things like her dream or whatever, and kind of projecting it on. So um, it could have been use of a scrim. We'll talk about a scrim in a little while too. But it had that. It was it was crazy. Selective realism mingles with the, ex the expressive with the lifelike. So again, so we have, you know, <laughs> whenever I think of something like this, I think of, um, you know, combining real people and puppets, I think of Sesame Street. Okay, now we, we don't think anything of it. You know, you see a character walk on stage and then you see a puppet talk to that live person. It's because we all grew up with that. You know, so, but that was a real abstract idea back then. What are you, you know, having a conversation with the puppet? So. Postmodern design disrupts unifying stylistic themes and replaces them with assemblages of different and unrelated styles. So postmodern, we are living in the postmodern age, which means after modern, which modern usually means now. So it's very confusing. So modern theater, actually talks about like um, the 1900s, the early, early 1900s, that's called modern. Um, and we're gonna get to that in a couple of chapters. And that's where they have all the, the ism, the symbolism and expressivism, all that kind of stuff, that's called modern. We are now postmodern, which means after modern. And so we take different things from the different eras and combine them. That's kind of, we are not surprised by that anymore. That if we take, you know, realism and throw it in with abstract and throw that in with a couple of puppets, you know, <laughs> we, we accept it. It's kind of what we do. So successful postmodern design can combine disparate historical elements. So that means different kinds of historical elements. So we can have, um, you know, someone playing Shakespeare walk on and someone can't play Aristotle so on. You know, and someone, you know, I don't know, playing um, a modern director and come on stage and I'll have conversations and we will accept that, you know. Um, so it highlights theatrical artifice. Artifice means that theater isn't real, right? It's, it's a facade, it's not, okay. And it provokes the audience while resonating with the deeper themes of the play. Audiences are not, easily entertained or surprised. Some, some are, right? Some want the play to succeed and want it to be great, but we are, we live in an era where it's entertaining, entertaining. I've got this thing and I keep flipping, right? And not only that, but if I'm looking at something on YouTube, I'm like, three seconds, no, don't like that. <laughs> but let's see what else is related. You know, <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't give it a lot of time, <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you actually hold a remote, like you're my age, 
you know, you flip through the channels and flip through the channels. Um, we don't give things a lot of time. So to be successful, postmodernism has to grab you, surprise you, throw you for a loop, you know, that kind of thing sometimes. Just to make it, make you want to stay. Remember, give you that intrigue where you want to see more and more and more. What is next? Okay, we talked about this. The best more than just backing for the play. Okay, so talking about the scenic materials, I just had a list and I'd like to show you. I had, I'd like to show you what it look like because not everybody under, understands or knows. So platforms, flats, and draperies. These are the three important things, scenic design elements. They're the building blocks. Okay, so platforms are this. It's usually four by eight, I think I told you. And you can use multiple platforms and then take these and make them smaller to make your stage and to make several different heights on a stage so we can have people up on this platform and then take them to this platform. And it gives people, um, you know, a sense of looming over somebody else. And um, just depends on, and you can see them. And that's the important part. They can go up here and you can see them. So platforms are one of the building blocks. The other things are flat. So this is what a flat looks like on the outside. It can have cutouts for windows or it can be solid. Okay. Most of the time this is covered. Well, back in the old days, it used to be covered with canvas or muslin. Um, and then you would just paint it and then you'd repaint it and then you'd repaint it. So your flats would end up having you know, this much paint on them from being painted over and over and over. Just paint it all dark gray again and start over. Uh, now, well, they still do that flat to some extent, but there's something called a Hollywood flat. And the Hollywood flat, this instead of being fabric, it's um, a real thin board. Okay, called masonite. And this is what it looks like in the back. Okay. These are the kinds of braces they stuff it. You can go on here. And this is very standard. They have these little corner, little corners like this. So if you ever go into a shop, there'll be all sorts of little corners over there because somebody's cut them all out to build flats for us later. And they have these little um, you know, things that join the pieces of wood together and the braces and things like that. A lot of times they'll have a, um, like a triangle that folds out here so it can stand up by itself. Uh, but then sometimes they're just attached to more and more flats. So the whole thing is kind of got a brace. But that's a flat. And then drapery is the last part. I talked to you about the travelers. Um, these things on the side, there's, if you look at the stage, there's more than one set of drapes, not just. The one that closes and opens in the front, that's called the grand drape. Okay, that's the big drape, the drape, the big curtain. Um, but each of these are designed to hide things, usually actors and set pieces and all sorts of things like that. They're hiding back here. I always tell actors, if the audience, if you can see the audience, the audience can see you. So if you stick your head out a little bit and you see the audience, guess what? They're seeing the top of your head. So you get Behind, you know, maybe they can see your eyeballs. Um, and I dealt with a lot of little kids. So I usually start the show by saying, you know, okay, so before we start, oh, wait, like three or four years, everybody say hi to their parents. Because <laughs> they're like, hi, mom. You know, like they never see <laughs> Literally, they dropped you off here a few minutes ago. <laughs> so the drapery is going to, hide and mask things backstage. Okay, sound. No, not sound. Scrim. Okay, I was talking a little bit about a scrim. A scrim is a, um, it's a cloth, it's a piece of fabric that you can um, project things on. And then when you shine light from the other side of it, you can see what's behind it. So they might start out um, a play with a scrim all the way down and a scene on it, like 
like it's a, a city or something like that. And that's how the play starts. And then a little while maybe after the show is after the show is finished. And then they go off and then all of a sudden the strip the lights go down, but we're not from the front, but the lights come on from behind it and you see the whole thing from the front. That's the real play. And the strip goes up and the actors go into the explore strip. So you can do a lot of fun things with it. Um, this I think is a memory or something. And they're projecting the scrim while she's talking, while she's explaining it. Um, and it can make whole sets instantly appear and disappear. So then all of a sudden you've seen all this thing and then boom, there's another scene that comes up on the screen. So it, look, you're looking at something basically through a screen, but the screen is treated with such material that when you shine something from the front, you can't see anything behind it. When you shine it from the back, you can see through it. So pretty cool. Scrims are pretty cool. Stage machinery can create a virtual dance of scenic elements to support and accompany the dramatic action. This is the old stage machinery. Remember I showed you that video where all the flats were coming in and out and the guys were underneath, you know, pushing the poles and um, all that kind of stuff. That's what this is. That's the old stage machinery. The new stage machinery does the same thing, but it looks a little bit but this is a hydraulic lift, <laughs> you know, that actually raises somebody up, pulls somebody down. I don't know if I shared this with you. When I was in college, I was in a, I was working a show called Agnes of God. And the designer thought it'd be really cool if like blocks rose up out of the set um, and like a block would rise up out of the set and then that would be a chair. And then it would sink back down into the set. And then I, there was a, a smaller one like this that would rise up out of the set. And it was this woman's ashtray. <laughs> okay. It would slide back down into the set. And it looked like hydraulic, but it wasn't. It was us. Okay. <laughs> there were about six or seven of us that the stage was built about this high. So we had to crawl underneath there and live there for the whole show. And then when it was time, we had little flashlights down there, um, me and the other person would raise up our block and put something underneath it to hold it there. So it looked like it would raise that up. And then it was kind of okay, all right. And one of those would pull the thing out and slowly lower it down so it looked like hydraulic. It's a great effect. You have, you know, manpower. You don't have, you don't have any money. You don't have any budget, but you have a lot of students. And they need credit, so <laughs> you got your stagecraft credit, and we got our lab credit. So we were the hydraulics. Uh, so, um, and I told you, did I tell you about Aladdin? About the, the Aladdin, the floating, yeah, okay, yeah, the float big machine, yeah, giant machine that had them floating and stuff like that. So, stage machinery can be pretty cool. Sound, wait, 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 I did want to say that. Um, back. Uh, sound is considered by the scenic designer. That's something that I hadn't mentioned before. Um, the famous clip for the actor's footfalls as well as the visual elements. So actors usually wear something called character shoes. And character shoes, these are what turn into tap shoes, especially females. You put taps on them, they become tap shoes. You take the taps off, they're just character shoes. But they are not quiet. They're, they're soles are not really hard, but you have to figure out what the person is wearing because sometimes people wear really noisy shoes. So they walk across stage and it's, oh, oh, oh. Um, I don't know what they're wearing in rumors, but the, you know, the, I know, I think it's still set in the 90s and it's a bunch of people going to a party. So I imagine the women have some high heels on that are going to make noises when they walk. And um, so they always tell you when you're on stage, try to get soft sole shoes to make the least amount of noise. But a designer has to figure that out too. So a lot of times when they have people making the most noise when they're walking across the set or whatever, they'll have the lights out. So you might hear in the audience, you know, but you don't have to, well, it, sh it shouldn't be distracting. Sometimes they'll build in some sort of, put some material underneath so that it doesn't quite sound so loud. But sound is something, huh? 
Yeah, like carpet or even like a blanket, you know, whatever. So just the, when they step up, because it's hollow. Remember, I showed you what the platforms look like. So they're hollow, so that it's not, doesn't quite sound so loud. Um, most of the time, we just feel. But it is something that a scenic designer has to think about sometimes. Okay. If you are going to design anything, you're going to be a scenic designer, costume designer, makeup designer. This is the process. So first you read the play, and the first time you read it, it should just be for enjoyment. And second time you reread it and you take notes. Okay, you're gonna read the play and then write down everything that you think if you're, you know, scenery, what's important. Oh, they say they look out the window here. That means that I have to build a window. Okay. Oh, they say this, oh, I'm going upstairs now. Well, am I actually going to build stairs that people see them go upstairs? Or are we gonna pretend and that's gonna be off? Out. So there's a show called Brighton Beach Memoirs that has a um, an upstairs and a downstairs that is talked about and kind of like the, the next to normal play I talked about where they had stairs where you could see the people on the top level and you can see the people on the bottom level. So um, you know, direct designers excuse me do that sometimes. And I know for rumors it's supposed to be two levels. But I think that they only have a very small staircase, like one, like five steps or something. So depends on the theater that you're using too. So you read and you reread the play and you take notes. Then they conduct research on the play and its historical period. Okay, I think like I said, um, I told you before, Laura's going to be a midsummer night's dream next semester, taking place in the 1980s. So if I'm designing costumes, I'm not going to look at, you know. Athens is circa 1500s or whatever, whatever it was written. I'm going to look at the 1980s and then see how those characters can fit into 1980s clothes and still have the same kind of thing going on. Um, consider the type of theater that the production is going to be produced in, especially if you're designing scenery, um, even costumes too. How big is the theater? Even makeup, because if you're doing an old age on someone, you're, you need to know how far away from the audience they're going to be. I, I, I like doing old age makeup and I got asked to go with the group doing one act to go do, because this one person was supposed to be really, really old. And I did it and, you know, from this far away, it looked really good. But when you sat in the audience, you couldn't see it. It kind of blended into our face. So I had to make it much darker and the lines thicker and more pronounced so that the audience could see it. But then when it's that much and you're talking, or when your audience is up close, then it's too much. And it just looks like it's too. So you need to know where are we doing this in the round? Are we doing this, you know, over in McAllister that seats a thousand people? You know, or are we doing it in our, you know, hundred seat theater over here, whatever it is. So you have to think about the type of theater. And then you carry out extensive discussions with the director and with the other designers. You don't want to have costumes that are huge if your scene design is really narrow, like they have to go through a passageway or a door or something, and the costumes don't fit. That doesn't work. So you gotta think about all those things. All right. Um, scrolling down a little bit. We talked about lighting. We talked about the lighting plot. So a play depends on its lighting to signal shifts in location. So sometimes you want to show, okay, you know, we are we're in the living room and um, this part of the, the wall is really important. And then your other scene might be over here and it might shine somewhere else. So your lighting shows different locations and different things that you want to show. It can also change the mood. And um, so seeing something like this, your everything is dark. You can kind of see this guy behind here. But we know these are the two actors we're supposed to be looking at. We're not really supposed to be looking at the rest of the scenery. So it can change the mood. This is obviously a much more intimate scene. Something's going on there that we need to pay attention to and everything else is dark around it. So 
You don't have to do it just with scenery. Lighting can do that too. It can create unsettling effects and mysterious things. And then highly expressive lighting and projections when applied to a production is utilizing only a cyclorama, neutrally clad actors, set piece, sculpture, stage mechanism. Um, this is, I was gonna say, and create an infinite variety of convincing theatrical environments. This is a cyclorama. It is basically a big white thing. <laughs> It's not really a sheet, it's more like a projector screen, more like this kind of material. And it's usually at the very back of the theater. There's usually one hanging up. Sometimes it's curved, like that's in cyclorama. Sometimes it comes down onto the floor. Um, and projections with light only, you can change your scene. You can make it all sorts of different things. For example, that. All of a sudden, you see how the, the site is it's got the blues and the purples and then up to the oranges and so it's, it's all done with light. And we know rather than it being that, it, it gives us an idea of where we are and when we are and what time of the day. They did a beautiful job with it in the last show they did, um, Anatomy of Grey. And they even had like a box that they made that um, they cut out a circle and so it looked like it was the moon up there. I say, and it, it was beautiful. So, but with the spike and a box with a circle cut out of it and they lit it, you know, from the inside, things like that, put a scrim on it so that it shined different colors. I mean, that a psych, so cyclorama, we call it a psych, C-Y-C. You'll see and hear that term. That's one of the terms you're gonna have to know. Psych, a psych, cyclorama. We already talked about costumes and we were, we had just started sound, correct? Uh -huh. Oh, my little gift, look at that. So music and sound effects have been used since ancient times. As a matter of fact, um, so Aristotle, remember we talked about the six elements that needed to exist in a tragedy. And one of them was music, right? It started out, the ancient Greeks started out anyway, with, um, they call them dithyrams. And so a whole bunch of people would come on and all sing at the same time. So there was always music involved. And the chorus was just that, they sang the things, right? And then, you know, um, Dionysus, our first, not Dionysus, I'm sorry, Festus, our first actor, stepped out of the chorus and spoke all by his lonesome. Right? That's where we get the first actor. But there's always been music. In Roman times, the theater was much more like musicals that we have today. And as a matter of fact, there was always a flautist, somebody played the flute on stage at all times. They had a really neat looking flute thing. If you look at like the old vases and things, vases, vases, um, and like it had three, you know, things coming out of it, thinking it looked more like what a bagpipe would be or something. Um, but they had some really interesting music that went with their things. But music has always been part of theater. Even when you think about, you know, the church drama. So remember there was the, I, I told you there was like a thousand years where theater didn't happen. And then all of a sudden it came back. And that's where it came back was in liturgical drama where, um, they were singing, and but one person was singing, and then another person was speaking. Uh, they were they were doing Easter. It was, whom do you seek? You no, know, we seek Jesus. <laughs> He's not here. He has raised from the dead. Go, <laughs> whatever, whatever the angel said. That was woo. That's the dawn of Peter coming back. Um, so Shakespeare's plays called for trumpet flourishes and the noises of a sea fight. And so there's, they're all written into the plays. There's always some sort of music and noise and sound effects. Um, Pre-electricity time, they use rain drums and thunder sheets. So remember when we were looking at that, you know, they had that box that kind of tilted back and forth. 
know that rock to roll in to rumble. This is the same kind of thing, except that you can have it uh, rumble for longer, right? Because <laughs> you can spin. Somebody's ringing this around, and this is all the thunder rolls, the thunder rolls. This uh, big piece of metal, the same kind of thing. And you can just go like, so big boom, kind of a gong kind of thing. So before we ever had electricity, we still had sound effects. Okay. Then in the 1970s and 1980s, this little guy came on the scene. Yeah, I had one. I, I remember the Christmas I got my boom box. It wasn't that big. It was probably not that big. Okay. I was that cool. But I do remember having, once we could record music and then play it again whenever we wanted to, that kind of changed how music was done in theater. You know, it changed sound effects. Now, if I want, I use sound effects all the time in my shows where, especially the kids shows where I have, Somebody go on stage and it sounded like everything fell out of a closet, you know, like you know, whatever they're doing, and come back on. I found it, whatever it was. Um, but we can record and we can play things back. So we could have music without having a full orchestra. Now they still have shows where you have a full orchestra. I think the when I went to go see Lion King, at least not this, it wasn't this time, it was the time before. You could walk down to the pit and look down there, and there's a whole orchestra. So um, I was in, I come down to several of the children's shows when I was in college, and the author, the playwright, was also the musician, because they were musicals. He'd written the music, and he was kind of traveling with the keyboard, and, uh, <laughs> and play all the songs. So, you know, um, so sometimes there are still live musicians, but this, the ability to record and play things back really changed how sound was used in the theater. We didn't have to just have people banging on the, and what, what if the guy falls asleep who's supposed to make the thunder go, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. So there's three types of sound application. There's sound effects, electronic. Like I said, we have them on tape now. And the live sound effects, there are still, still people that, you know, stand behind the stage and, you know, sneeze when they're supposed to, or, you know, make whatever sounds they are. There was a, a play that we did where there was the voice of God, right? And I don't remember why, but instead of recording this voice of God, the guy would stand backstage and walk into the microphone, you know, whatever, every night. Actors, you know, don't want to be heard. There's sound reinforcement. So you're watching a play and the suspense is starting to build. And there's the music that's playing underneath, or the music that's playing underneath that says, oh, the two are falling in love, or whatever it may be, there's kind of a reinforcement to what's happening on stage. We had that with musicals, but again, those were live orchestras. Now we also have recordings that can do that. Um, another sound reinforcement are body microphones. Anybody here ever use body microphones? Okay. You use the kind that you pin on? Those are awful. Because when you're talking this way, everybody can hear you. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be loud again. So um, they have to figure out where to put those. And now, if you see on Broadway, they take the microphones and they weave them into their wigs or on their head, and they have them right here. Okay, you don't see the microphone. They're not taped to their face. You know, they're right here so that they don't obstruct the makeup. Um, so, but yeah, up there on their forehead. And they're very powerful and directional so that they get all the sound. But that, that way, if the actor bends over, you can still hear them and it doesn't make any difference because they are attached to their head. So, um, and that's where their mouth is. So that's a good thing. But body microphones are something that can help. I will tell you, I've never, never seen a show where all the microphones work the way they're supposed to. Okay, um, my church theater, when we do it there, somebody's mic always goes out or gets feedback or has a glitch in it or somebody turns and they're not talking into their mic, right? There's, there's always something, it, even the, the high school theaters that I worked at. So that is why you train actors to not have to use microphones. 
when you're on Broadway, though. I kind of get it. Then there's stage microphones. So one of the things that I did I, when I did Fiddler on the Roof, they wanted to hang the microphones down from, the, it was actually an open air theater. So you'd have to put a whole room up there and hang the microphones down. They had done that before. That makes for a lot of problems with your lighting designer because you light and there's this line where the <laughs> microphone's hanging down. So to try to light around them is really hard. So instead what we had, we had um, microphones that were like, uh, there was like a plastic diamond that would kind of reflect the sound and they had them at the end of the stage. So that the actors, they really just needed to project towards the nearest microphone. And they had like four or five of them across the stage. And if they could project to there, then the sound would go further. So you didn't want to have them too far upstage, which is the back of the stage, saying their lines, unless they had a big booming voice that could carry at least the, from the stage. And then we have music that's usually recorded, right? So we have the music that plays during scenes. We have music for scene changes. Um, a lot of times that's what they'll do. The lights will go down and you hear music while they're changing a scene until it comes back up again. So the sound designer is responsible for the design of the sound system when there's not one present. So sometimes, um, I know again in my, my little theaters that I've worked at, we haven't always had a soundboard. So we have to rent them. And then anytime you rent them, you know, you have to program the whole thing. So it's not just in tune to whatever you have. You have to make sure that all of the mics are on different channels. And um, turn on the board. It's not, I think that lighting has been made a lot easier where you could just press a button and the light changes to the next scene and the light changes to the next scene. Sound is not quite so easy because sometimes, oh my gosh, this person's microphone went out. Well, I'm going to make the person that's standing next to them make their mic louder so that they can pick up what that other person is saying. So, I, I mean, you have to be able to think on your feet and know when to bring the music in and when to fade it out. And so, um, yeah, all of these little channels here, so one microphone or one sound or, you know, it's, it's some interesting stuff that you gotta do when you're doing sound. Okay, so rapid development of audio recording and playback, playback technologies led to a virtual revolution, like I said, in the area of sound design and the emergence of an officially designated sound designer in theaters. Before that, they were kind of just people that, all right, you help change the set, you make the, that, that sound, you know? <laughs> they were kind of the crew people that did it or it was kind of just designated throughout with the actors and the, the stage people. But now that we can record things, you know, that kind of all changed. All musicals and many non-musicals employ electronic sound enhancements that reinforces the actor's voices and creates a louder than live sonic ambience. So sometimes you want your actors to sound even louder. So having the microphones does help, even on the end of the stage. And um, when you're playing in an auditorium like McAllister, which is, like I said, a thousand people and there's people up in the balcony, sometimes you do need a microphone or at least some really good stage mics. Uh, the stage sounds can be realistic, stylized, stereophonically localized, or pervasive and in your head. Okay, that's kind of scary, right? But, they, but um, I haven't seen this in a theater show, but I know like sometimes when you go to the movies, it's like, oh my God, I can feel the bass in my chest. You know, it's like you hear the sound, it's like, okay, all right, it's taking the breath away from me. You don't want to be that loud in the theater, but, um, so uh, let's see, music and sound effects evoke mood, support emotion, intensify an action, and provide transitions into scenes or in between scenes. And sound, despite its subtle role in the overall sonography of the play, is one of the key components of an effective moving performance. Having good sound effects can enhance or detract from a play, depending on their good or not. Okay, theater technologies and special effects. Puppets. So I mentioned to you Sesame Street, Avenue Q, and those are kind of obvious where people interact with puppets. 
the puppets are used in many different ways, kind of like that big elephant that I said that was kind of a puppet. Um, you know, people riding on this horse. We know that there's uh, people, you know, <laughs> there's two guys, this horse has eight legs, all right? <laughs> so, um, right? There's two guys walking and carrying this puppet and somebody riding on top of it. But we understand and we will accept that as the horse rather than you know trying to make one that actually looks like a horse that looks fake you know sometimes you want to do something abstract so that people understand what you're trying to get across and they're not that kind of critical judgmental on how you how do you do things so any object when framed and manipulated intentionally can be perceived as performance have you watched america's got talent Tape face. Okay, so tape face. I actually went and saw tape face in Vegas, huh? He's hysterical, but he makes, you know, their oven mitts, you know, and he makes them, you know, talk to each other and sing to each other and stuff. Whatever. Um, and so anything, you can use anything as a puppet. There's a very famous dance scene where Fred Astaire, any of you heard of Fred Astaire? He's a very, very famous dancer from like the 1940s. Gene Kelly? Have heard of Gene Kelly? Gene Kelly, Lane Johnson, and Daniel Moran. They're all in there, okay? But Fred Astaire is a very famous dancer, and there's a famous scene of him dancing with a coat rack and making the coat rack look good, right? <laughs> it looks like a person in the way that, as if you've ever seen Singing in the Rain, um, Donald O'Connor does the, the make him laugh, make him laugh, and he has the dummy there that doesn't have a head on it, and he, he uses it, and it looks like it's, you know, dancing with him. So anything can be used as a puppet as long as it's made to um, be perceived as something that's performing. Societies all over the world have nurtured traditions of beautiful puppetry. There is still, um, in India, there's the shadow puppets. Shadow puppets are huge. And um, in Japan, they have the bunraku, which are puppets that are three quarters the size of a regular person. So they're not small, and it takes three people to manipulate them, okay? And they like wear black, and you have to like train for years to be able to move the head. <laughs> okay, you, know, you start off moving the right leg or something, I don't know. Um, puppets inspired by traditional and pop cultural sources have been central to several major recent Broadway productions. And puppets tap into the ability for an audience to treat a clearly artificial construction as a deeply human reality. Um, more special effects and theatrical technologies, projections. Projections were only rudimentary until the development of a steady beam of focused incandescent electric light in the late 1800s, like 1890, <laughs> you know. So projections were not used then. Projections are used now a lot. As a result of technology, the projection designer has become a new member of the theatrical design team around the world. So I told you that again about that Anastasia with the hologram and then with the train that's you know, it looks like it's going this way, and then when it turns this way, the projection looks like it's going that way. When it turns this way, the projection looks like it's going this way. I'm still not sure how they did it. They said they had 400 little cameras. I don't know. Um, but it was spectacular. And so that person, as a designer, was never part of the theater team until now. Now that project, we could have a projection designer on our team as part of the scenic design. Special effects techniques invented to maximize the audience interest and awe include fire, explosions, fog, smoke, wind, rain, snow, lightning, spurts of blood, those are my favorite, and mysterious arrivals and disappearances. So again, Hamlet's father arises out of the middle of the, the earth or whatever, those trap doors and, um, you know, fog. Oh my gosh, Roscoe Fogg has a certain scent, and I can tell you anywhere it's like, oh, somebody's using Roscoe Fogg. <laughs> so those fog machines, I have a couple of them. Um, yeah, I did a lot of Halloween stuff when I had my my little theater, um, and so. But there was a even in the play that goes wrong, 
it's supposed to be snowing out and uh, someone has the box and it's supposed to have like, it's supposed to be like a shaker box, like, like a salt and pepper shaker, right? So it just has a few holes in it. So when you shake it, little flurries of the snow come out and like something happens and the whole box falls and the whole dumps on them or whatever. Um, so you've got all sorts of effects like that. Spurts of blood, like I said, love it. Um, theaters, both large and small, are increasingly using video or uh, VR, virtual reality, and other video technology to enhance their productions. I'm not sure how that's being used. But that sounds pretty cool to me, how they're using virtual reality. And maybe that was part of the projection thing that I saw with Anastasia. Okay. So who works on the stage? There is the production stage manager. They call them production stage manager, but um, typically we just call them stage manager. Okay, so they call them the PSM in your book or whatever, but we just call them the SM, <laughs> stage manager. This stage manager has existed since the 18th century. Since we first had a director, then we needed somebody to direct the people backstage when the director couldn't be there to direct. So tell the actors, okay, go on now, okay? No. Okay, now it's time to do this. Now it's time to do that. So they needed to have somebody back there in charge. So the stage manager is the person that does this. They coordinate the scheduling, the staffing, the budgeting of every element of the production. I'm going to say, I don't necessarily agree with that budgeting part. Maybe they do that in um, you know, Broadway or something like that. But the production stage manager, yeah, they are usually the ones that make sure that they have they work with the technical director and hire a crew because the crew are the people that make the backstage happen. And they, um, you know, it was a little bit more difficult before to communicate with the people that were out there doing lighting and sound and stuff. But now we have headsets, okay? And they talk to each other throughout every single show. The stage manager has a book, it's like the Bible, whatever. And it has every cue, everything that's supposed to happen written and they never waver these are, you have to get those real people that really like to stick by the book right and they go through and whenever anything's happening they like okay now um so they they are there for all the rehearsals for the the load in which is when the scenery is, that's built in the shop is now moved and put on the stage um they are there for the operation the whole running of the show and they call the technical cues during the performance. They also make like a sign-in sheet for the actors, all right? So when an actor gets there, usually they have, it's, a, it's on the call board, it's usually a big poster board and it has their name and it has the date and you're supposed to go initial it so that somebody can't just order your signature or put a check mark in the wrong spot. Um, and the stage manager makes sure that everybody's there. And if there's not somebody there, they have to find them. Back before cell phones, I was working at a play at San Antonio Little Theater with Pippin, and one of the guys played one of the major roles. Um, didn't show up, and he didn't show up, and he didn't show up, and we didn't have understudy. And it was five minutes before the production, and he finally showed up, and he did this like all the time. After like about we we had an eight week run, so after about week four. He started just showing up like right before the show started. The stage manager would be pulling her hair out. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, because I mean, you didn't know. You didn't know if he's in a car accident. What if he doesn't get there in time and we have to start the show? He would go out there and start the show. So, um, but it's their, it's their job, it's their responsibility. Once the director's gone, it's all the stage managers. Um, stage managers in full charge of the show during the performance. Okay, so we have the production stage manager here, uh, coordinates the director's work with that of the actors in the technical and design departments and maintains the production. Then there's the ASM, which is assistant stage manager. Basically, they assist the stage manager. Um, they set out the props, they follow the script, they prompt actors, it's usually the assistant stage manager Okay, I need to go. Tell, okay, you've got five minutes to be on stage. Okay, all right, all right, you need to go now. <laughs> Whatever. Um, by the way, if you're ever on the show, 
and a state manager tells you, okay, you have 10 minutes. The correct response is, thank you, 10, because it lets them know they heard you and it lets them know that they heard exactly how long they have and they've actually said it out loud. So yeah, thank you, 10. You know, you go five minutes, thank you, five. So you, you need to respond, not just go, uh-huh. So that would be the assistant stage manager. Um, they take line notes. So if somebody has messed up a line during the show, they will mark it down. And afterwards, they will see you after the show and say, hey, you know what? You messed up this line. You need to look over your script in this part. Um, they might substitute for actors who may be temporarily away from the rehearsal hall, usually during rehearsal. The assistant stage manager will step in. A lot of times the stage manager will step in and take, you know, just do the act, the role, just so that the person who's acting has somebody to act against or with or knows where the bodies are. Um, they implement the PSM's calls to the actors and the crew chief, and they serve as the backstage ears and eyes. So because I said the stage manager is sitting in the booth with the headset on, calling when this sound comes in, when this set moves on, when you know this light changes. And so the assistant is going around and saying, hey, uh, so-and-so fell backstage and sprained his ankle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. Things like that do happen. Okay, and then lastly, we have the technical director. I think this is lastly, responsible for the scenery, lighting, sound, and stage machinery. The technical director, all of that falls under the technical director's umbrella. Um, usually they're in charge of building the scenery. So you design the show, you're the designer, you give them the model, okay, and some sketches and schematics, and they will take out, usually when you build a model, you build it in what we call scale. So you say one inch equals one foot, or a half an inch equals one foot. Okay, so if it's one and a half inches tall, then it's three feet. Okay, so he measures all those things and then translates them to real life. Okay, how much wood do I have to buy to make that fit? So the technical director does all that, draws out the technical plans. Okay, we're gonna build this, we're gonna build this, we're gonna build this. Um, that does the working drawings based off the designer's work and oversees the load in, okay? Because these are all his set pieces that he's been working on. So he's gonna oversee and make sure it all goes and fits in the theater just right. Everything hooks together the way it's supposed to hook together. Things are screwed in the way they're supposed to be screwed in. And um, also they're the ones that tell the crew, this is how this moves on and this is how this moves off. Um, worked on a production of Big River which is the story of Huckleberry Finn. So he's, he and Jim are floating down the Mississippi on a raft. And they had a platform that was kind of loosely tied to a track. And they could actually push it along with like a pole, like they were pushing it along the river. So, um, but those kind of things are real specific. Um, organizes and runs the strike. Everyone has to be at strike. Strike does not mean we're quitting. Okay. Strike means we're striking everything off of the stage. So everything that we put on, we have to take apart. And um, all of the actors are usually required to be there and help out the strike, even though actors don't always the most helpful. Speaking, being an actor myself. Um, the TD, technical director. So let's see, drafts the working drawings, overseeing the scenery. There are also other people that work in the scene shop. Um, production carpenters, scenic artists, welders. Okay, so yes, there is welding going on in the set as well. These are other people that work in your technical production team. So there's specialists in the costume shop, there's costume directors, there's dyers, people that that is what they do. They dye fabric. We used to have these great big vats, they still do, I'm sure, at Texas State, where, okay, we're going to dye everything in here blue, you know, okay. So there are people that that's what they do. Cutters, there are people that are specifically trying to cut out the material. Okay, that's their job, there are cutters. Um, first hands, that's usually like, like a captain will have their first bait. Okay, so the first person underneath them are called the first hands. There are stitchers, there are craft specialists, especially if you're making puppets, things like that. There are hairstylists and wig makers, wardrobe supervisors and dressers. There are specialists 
within lighting and sound and makeup, electricians, master electricians, lighting board and follow spot operators. Whenever you see a spot that's or a spotlight that's following somebody around, there's usually a person behind that. It's not me because I'm not really good at it. It's like, oh, well, no, they didn't go that far. <laughs> uh, there's sound engineers, sound designers, soundboard operator, and makeup artists. And all of these people, you know, make up the backstage, the things that you don't see. Um, ways in which theater travels into new locations and beyond theater buildings. Street theater. Okay, we talk about street theater. Street, if you're doing theater in the middle of the street, oh, street theater, that you have to have special kinds of design for things that are portable, for things that you can take with you, put up and take down quickly. But we were doing those touring shows at the elementary school, that kind of thing. Um, there's site-specific theater, which emphasizes and dramatizes the history and previous usage of the place where it's staged. When I was in um, Rome, um, we had a tour guide that was showing us all of the different things. This was this you know piece of building. This is what this was. This is what this was. And um, we got to the place where Julius Caesar died, and Mark Antony gave the last speech. And she got up there and said Mark Antony's speech. And so she was like using the history of what it was for theater. It was brilliant. Okay. Um, immersive theater. Maybe you see that immersive Van Gogh thing. Okay, did any of you go? Did you go? Right? You're immersed in the middle of the projections and stuff like that. Okay, that's a new kind of thing that's out there. And these are performances that break down the separation of audience. Museums and stuff are using it now. Yes, right. So we're going to go to where this battle happened and see this reenactment of the war. And some of those place specific, you know, theater. Um, so Disneyland, Haunted Museum, uh, Haunted Houses, and museums all use kind of this thing. So. Ta-da, 